Well, it's been a long day full of insights, conflicting insights uh, often, and uh, now in this last uh, session, we're not going to try to have the nice uh, synthesis where we bring uh, everybody together in an easy, uh, shallow uh, consensus. Uh, I'm sure we'll still have a lot of discussions, but for that, uh, I'm glad that we have two uh, panelists with, when, who are both in their own ways actually quite uh, uh, exceptional. And, uh, Claire Lockhart, uh, she's a co-founder and CEO of the Institute for State Effectiveness with Ashraf Ghani, and, uh, who was the first Minister of Finance of uh, the new uh, Afghanistan. And, uh, well, everybody knows uh, the uh, book uh, she co-signed with Ashraf, Fixing Failed States a framework for rebuilding a fractured work, uh, world. Uh, she's certainly one of the persons who has given the most thought to uh, both to Afghanistan and to the broader issue of how a fragile state, as they're called, uh, can be uh, uh, consolidated, put together, and uh, the difficult relationship between foreigners in a country that they want to help. Uh, James Shin, uh, has uh, had a most interesting career. In, uh, a che I, uh, checkered past. A checkered means. past, uh, working at the State Department, uh, being a very successful Silicon Valley entrepreneur, being a nat national intelligence uh, officer for East Asia at the CIA, and then an assistant secretary for Asia at the Pentagon, and now a professor uh, at Princeton. And uh, I'm happy to say, uh, uh, a partner in the uh, task force at the Century Foundation uh, on Afghanistan. I want to mention the Century Foundation because I mean, uh, several of the I mean, uh, uh, speakers today have been uh, working on that collective effort uh, of the Century Foundation uh, uh, to make sense of I mean, a strategy uh, for Afghanistan. And so uh, I think the uh, wealth of information in this panel also owes something to I mean, the work of the uh, Century Foundation, I want to uh, pay tribute to the Foundation and to uh, Jeff Laurenti, uh, who is uh, here today uh, uh, from the Foundation with uh, Michael Hanna. Um, so first I will ask uh, Claire Lokat to speak and then Jim Shin and uh, then I'll try to uh, uh, put together all that and uh, open for uh, last uh, round of questions. Claire. Thank you for the, for the opportunity to provide some reflections. Um, I think Afghanistan might be at its second open moment in the last decade. The first open moment being after the tragedy of 9-11, um, when the Bonn Agreement was put together, when there was an enormous amount of hope from certainly within the population that things would be different. Um, the trajectory went in one direction and then another. Now there's a commitment of an extraordinary amount of forces and resources that frankly wasn't there in the first five years after, after 2001. Um, but there's a real question about what kind of trajectory um, the, the future will, will go in, in from, from now on. Um, and a lot of unknowns. And I think we certainly know from looking back over the last decade that human agency and leadership are really very, very important. Um, today we've heard both a lot of, of optimism um, and a lot of pessimism. And I wonder whether we don't need to bring these into some kind of balance. We must be realistic. Nobody's, I don't think, was ever talking about, but certainly isn't now, about building a Switzerland or a Valhalla, um, divorced from reality. Um, so there's an enormous need to be realistic and have a realistic analysis of, of what's happening on the ground. Um, but I think we should also recognize that pessimism can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Certainly when I first won a scholarship to come and study in the States, I was encouraged, absolutely, have rigorous criticism for up to a third of your time, but be sure to spend at least two-thirds of your time looking for ways to overcome the constraints you've identified and looking for possible pathways forward, which I think is the pur purpose of, of this session. Um, some things we can't know about the future. I personally think we can't know what trajectory, for example, a Taliban faction or, or group that, were they to form part of a coalition government or take over part of the country, what way they will go. I, d I don't think it's something we can know. Some things that we do know, we do know that the future will happen and we know that somewhere between 25 and 30 million Afghans um, 
the reality of the current visa regimes. We won't get visas to go, go elsewhere. There will be 25 million Afghans also living in, in, that, in that place. The future will happen. Um, and I think it's imperative to think through over the next 5, 10, 15 years what type of trajectories um, we might see. I'm going to take a brief detour into the past and then look forward at some of the elements um, that it might be useful or imperative to think about. Um, briefly delving into the past over the last 10 years, um, and this is fr from the perspective of somebody who had, had the privilege to be part of many discussions on, on both in New York at the UN and, and then on the ground in Afghanistan with the Afghan cabinet, with the UN, the World Bank, and, and, and other actors. Um, certainly between 2001 and 2005, there was a sense that the country was moving in a forward, in a positive direction. Um, I think something snapped and the trajectory reversed at about 2005. Um, I had the privilege to sit in both Lloyd Jiggers, the main Lloyd Jiggers, in, in 2002 and 2004. Um, then district head after district head stood up, including in, from those districts, which are now um, immersed in an insurgency and pledge their support to the process. Lakta Brahimi recently reflected on, on those Lloyd Jiggers and described um, the, the reality of, of the atmosphere and, and the sense that the country was pulling together. By 2006, the same district leaders were saying, you betrayed us. Um, so, some, something was snapped, a trust was lost, a sense of broken promises. Um, so the peace process was not consolidated um, now, what, what were the roots of what went wrong? I think this, these will, this will be de debated by historians for, for decades to come, and his, historians rightly say we can't tell, we can't write the history until 30 years has passed. But I think there were two major components. The failure to adapt a culture of warlordism and bring it within a culture of rule of law. And we heard Ambassador Halazad reflect on some of these dimensions as to why this happened. And it's not unique to Afghanistan. We see it in revolutionary resistance movements around the world. When they take power, when they, when they come into positions of authority, they find it psychologically extremely difficult to adapt to bureaucratic and democratic governance procedures after having led a top-down revolutionary or resistance movement um, or being parties to a civil war. And the second, I think, the second major failure was a way that we tipped billions of dollars collectively into an aid, aid complex that wasn't devoted in reality to building institutions. It actually asset stripped and undermined them and marginalized the people. Um, so going forward, um, I'll quickly go through five dimensions. And I think we've heard each of them um, reflected today. And I'll look particularly at the so-called civilian side, although I absolutely recognize, as has been reflected on, that you cannot <coughs> divorce the political and the military. Um, the use of force has to be um, bounded by um, its political objective, and to separate them is false. Um, the first is the need for a regional approach. Um, Ambassador Brahimi has been the first to admit that mistakes were made during the bomb process, but as an observer of what he did, I'll say that one of the things he did most brilliantly was put the region first. So while he had members of the P5, including Britain and France, practically beating down his door, he went to the region with some colleagues and he built a regional framework with Iran, with Pakistan, with the northern neighbors, with China, and got them on board. And on the ground, both the diplomacy and the economic um, constructs between 2001 and 2005 put the region first. After 2006, for some reason, I think it was partly because of the insurgency, because of NATO coming to the fore, um, it, was, it became a US, Europe, Canada construct. And the region was inadvertently, perhaps, left out of the construct. So that when um, the regional ambassadors were convened a couple of months ago, it was the first time they'd met in five years. So no wonder, and I think as we heard in the regional panel, there's a sense of being left out, of not being consulted. So going forward, one of the imperatives is to think about what kind of diplomatic and economic construct to build that engages the region appropriately. It's happening already within the region with Sark, with Carrick and others, but how to, to establish that and the role of the UN being indispensable to that. Um, the second, I think we need to potentially, absolutely to recognize the centrality of Afghan politics and the Afghan political reality. And perhaps while there may need to be some kind of deal, move away from seeing that as the whole piece. Um, perhaps moving away from a p political settlement, capital P, capital S, to a sense of a political process or political processes and one that are inclusive 
perhaps reframing the issue to one that looks at, as um, Ambassador Stefan de Mistura, the current SRSG, says, what do the Afghans want? What's the framework for all Afghans? And that perhaps needs to come first. And within that construct, um, how do we develop a processes for listening to, understanding, and redressing grievances of the Pashtun population as a whole, of Pashtun populations and different groups, and citizens in general? And um, see, re therefore, reconciliation in its broader sense of different constituencies of the population coming term to terms with each other in the past, and not just looking only to a narrow group. Um, an Afghan civil society leader recently said, in any society there are 1% thugs, 4% extremists, and 95% ordinary people. He said the problem comes in Afghanistan when we give the power and the money and the guns to the 1% who oppress the 95% who are left with nowhere to go except to ally themselves with the extremists. And I think fear that sometimes we fall into that pattern. It's easy to do so. Um, third, the question of state building in the public administration. Um, not talking about a Switzerland or a Valhalla, but any country on the world. In the, we're, our world is built on the constituent units of sovereign functioning states. And any country needs to perform at least a minimum set of responsibilities to its people in the international community. Um, I fear at the moment there are uh, thousands of small projects and initiatives which are being pursued without a sense of the whole. If one, in, when one's in Kabul, if you ask people, does anyone have a map of governance, an org chart of the government? No one's yet been able to produce one. Um, we have a fashion for the pr provinces one year, then it's the districts, then it's the village, but how does it fit together? And I think that sense is needed. You know, what are the rules of the game so that Afghans can govern themselves? And not, it's not a question of centralization versus decentralization, but which function should be performed at which level? Um, and I think the real missing dimension in, in thinking about the public administration is that the public administration isn't an abstract thing. It's actually run by people. And one of the in most enormous neglects has been the human capital of the country. Um, the needs assessment process of the UN and the World Bank, the UN agencies and the World Bank, in 2002 told the Afghan government, you're not allowed to invest in any money for any education over the age of 11 for Afghans. So the Afghan budget officers took out funding to the secondary schools and polytechnics and vocational schools that already existed. Now we complain several years on that Afghans have no capacity. We spend billions of dollars bringing it in from the outside. Last year, the higher education budget for the country and vocational training was $35 million. I think until this is addressed, it's no wonder that generals across the country are complaining there are no nurses, there are no doctors, there are no teachers for the schools and clinics that are being built. A major lacuna. Um, and then I think the, uh, the, the functioning of a minimally sovereign state is fundamental, but I think the paradox perhaps might be is that the entry point comes from two other dimensions, and perhaps we've neglected these, and Ashraf Ghani and I sometimes reflect that we would focus much more not on state building per se, but the balance of the state, the market, and civil society. So the market, the economy, Afghanistan does have the potential to be self-sufficient in revenue terms, and I believe that the next year provides the opportunity to develop and put in place a minerals governance framework for the at least one to three trillion dollars of potential um, minerals. And it's not just the, mineral, the, the revenue from the minerals itself, it's the fact that the minerals provide the basis for the development of infrastructure, which itself opens up the country. The revenue will come from trade and customs revenue when Afghanistan is increasingly integrated into the flows of global trade. Um, and as, as one American commentator recently said, oh, it's not about us leaving and turning the lights off. We can actually leave and leave the lights on if the elements of a functioning economy um, can be put in place. And then just closing on um, the society dimension. COIN actually recognizes the population. It argues for a population-centric approach. I wonder on the, the so-called civilian side if we haven't neglected but the population. We're talking about the state in such abstract, abstract terms about connecting the government to the people that we've forgotten that the people aren't a sack of potatoes, um, that they're agents themselves. And um, a, a recent gathering of civil society leaders from Afghanistan um, met outside the country recently and really bemoaned the fact that the space for civil society had been closed down. And I wonder whether the international community hasn't been complicit in that by talking and conceptualizing the state in these top-down, um, almost um, autocratic 
terms. So I question what's the role going forward for organizations like the UN um, to recognize their, their loyalty to in the space for the people and civil society um, in general and recognize that it's um, the attitude of the people um, and, and their actions and activities that will make the state function or not. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. I will first of all apologize for my voice. While you all were having lunch, I was at my doctor's office being diagnosed with bronchitis. When I told him I was coming to a panel, he gave me some Zithromax. When I told him the topic was peace in Afghanistan, he offered some Valium. <laughs> But my task from Jean-Marie today was actually not to present a, a reasoned case, but he told me to listen carefully to the panels during the day and try and extract some conclusions about, some conclusions or implications about what was said for the a process that might bring about uh, peace on Afghanistan. And so I have listened uh, carefully during the day. I confess to being still conf somewhat confused. As uh, Lakdar Brahimi often says, because we have spent time traveling together, he says, I, I thank you very much. I'm, I'm still confused, but now I'm confused in a much more sophisticated way. <laughs> and the, the question of the road ahead is a, is a hard one to to answer, particularly when there's so much disagreement about where we are, though there's more agreement on, on how we got there, certainly agreement on the mistakes that were made along the way. I, I, I don't know about you, but I was most impressed by, by Zal Khalizad's very frank uh, sort of forensic analysis of the bond process and some of the failings in, in, in uh, 2003, 4, and 5. You remember he, he initially defined these three lines of operations that had to be conducted more or less simultaneously in order to execute a strategy in Afghanistan. One was the military piece, one was the domestic political piece, and the third, of course, was the regional diplomatic piece. He gave us sort of a B plus on the military side, and I think he gave us a low C, us being the United States, since this tends to be a US-centric conversation. Kind of a low C on the political, domestic political and the regional diplomatic efforts. And it went downhill from there, with a very few exceptions, perhaps um, uh, Colonel George and Dante Paradiso, most of the panelists would have assigned even lower grades to, to uh, the effectiveness with which those three lines of operations were, be, were pursued. So the question mark then is going forward, how do, how do you, what's the prospects? What are the prospects for a strategy that in fact integrates these three lines of operation that would have reasonable possibility of bringing about a peace equilibrium, um, not unlike the one just described by, by Claire Lockhart. And I would venture th uh, th three, three modest observations that integrate some of these comments. The, the first one, I guess, goes back to fundamental strategy. So, so we're at SEPA here, and SEPA probably has a course on Strategy 101, and there's, it probably says in Strategy 101 that whatever your line of operation is, whether it's military, economic development, uh, political development or regional diplomacy, whatever your line of operation is, you need first of all to have a clear strategy. What are your objectives? You need to have clarity about the method. You need to have it sufficiently resourced to achieve the objectives. And perhaps most importantly is the fourth variable, particularly with respect to Afghanistan, which is time. You need to apply the resources long enough in the method that you've chosen to achieve the objectives that you've reduced in your strategy for starters. And this, most professors of IR, I think, would, or strate strategy studies would, would, would argue is invariant, whether you're dealing with Afghanistan or Guatemala uh, or any other crisis. So 
to me, listening to most of the discussions today, it's pretty clear that, that the time variable is probably where the strategy will run into the ground. The clear implication of most of the speakers was that the problem, the underlying problem of Afghanistan in terms of the, the destruction of human capital, in terms of the, the damage done physical and, and institutional, is so deep. And the centrality of Pakistan is, Pakistan is so close as a shadow over this that there is probably not enough time for a US-centric strategy to achieve a, a certainly not a, not a victory, a military victory as conventionally defined, but probably not even the first outcome that uh, Gilles Doronsoro suggested was one of the three possible ways this could play out. If that's true, then the implications for, and this is my second point, the implications for the prospects for peace in Afghanistan becomes much less of a US or NATO-led process and devolves much more, for better or for worse, but into the hands of the Afghans. All the belligerents in Afghanistan, the Karzai government, the Northern Alliance, uh, the Kota Shura, Haqqani, Hekmatyar, all the players, with the Pakistanis looking over their shoulder and meddling probably on a, on a semi-permanent basis. But where does that leave you? And again, listening to many of the speakers and a number of the questions, including some of the most interesting questions that weren't answered. Uh, the clear implication is that there are probably as many actors in, in this war, powerful actors in this war, with an incentive to sustain the conflict than there are for those who would like to have it brought to equilibrium. Right, I, I think I heard that either, either stated directly or implied several times. Some of, them, some of them motivated by the sheer amount of money that's cascading through the landscape, others like the narco traficantes who would just as soon have a, a low-grade war in most of the country so they can get on with their business. The peace. Peace isn't good if you own a security firm uh, or, or if you, uh, or for that matter, for the Pakistanis. Uh, Christine can talk about this at greater length about, about the political and economic consequences of this vast chain of, of um, containers en route from Karachi through Turkham Gate, spanning out through the rest of the country. But the bottom line is you have, at least for some indeterminate period of time, a large number of actors who have a greater motivation for sustained warfare than for peace. And they are likely because of the asymmetries of Afghan politics to outweigh what Michael Semple described in his discussion as this constituency for peace, which is probably, I'm sure you're right, probably statistically, uh, um, far more Afghans believe that to be the case, but for the moment, those with an incentive for sustained conflict have the money and the guns. So where does this leave you? It would suggest, if you combine that with the first point, which is the, the, the long trajectory of declining Western enthusiasm and support and commitment to the Afghan cause, you combine that with the, the large number of parties who have an interest in sustained conflict. At some point you would deduce that the parties interested in sustained conflict will realize that the game is ending. That the, 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 the money machine and the violence machine is, is petering out, at which point they will be faced with a choice. a lot of choices, and it won't be one group making one choice at one time in a Dayton-like framework, but there'll be a lot of choices probably in a somewhat messy, decentralized process. And the choice will be, again, I think along the, the lines described by Gilles de Ronsoro, which is they can continue in, in the face of dwindling 
uh, dwindling assets from the outside, both military and, and uh, economic, to engage, to, to treat Afghanistan like the object of a bus continued Buskashi game. And we've seen this movie before. Or they would decide that they'd that probably make sense for them in the long run, that their personal and their national interests are optimized by pursuing some kind of an equilibrium peace accord. Now, whether that's a fake accord or a, a temporary accord, as Gilles described, or whether that is an accord that has firmer foundations and a higher probability of being sustained, it's hard to tell. There are probably, uh, there'll probably be a range of choices, but having been, been old enough myself to have been in Vietnam in 1974 and having watched the first peace accord um, crumble, my guess is that um, there may be several iterations before you have a final equilibrium, which brings me to the third and, and final conclusion to draw from this conversation, which is, I guess, more to the mandate of Jean-Marie's Center for International Conflict Resolution, which presumably are the recipes that you try to apply using the, the best lessons that you can from where it's worked elsewhere, and also trying to avoid uh, the things that didn't work in other conflict resolution circumstances. I think the first, the, um, the first big takeaway, the first implication would be that to the degree that, that you're General Petraeus, or you are Richard Holbrook, or you are some other ISAF-related official who takes this seriously, if you accept these first two points, then it tells you that you need to construct the strategy by which you conduct those three lines of operation, the military piece, the domestic political negotiation piece, and certainly the regional diplomatic piece, particularly the Pakistan diplomatic piece, with a clear eye to what kind of an equilibrium condition that you want, which really means to say that you, you are in a difficult situation of using decreasing application of resources, both soldiers and money, in order to get people to do what you want them to do. But that's the hand that has to be played. The corollary to that is that you therefore need to have a very clear idea of what the political end game is, which means that you need to engage the other actors in this game who can bring about, or at least have a reasonable chance of both filling out the stakes of all the other actors and perhaps beginning the process of a diplomatic reconciliation, whether you call it bond two or, or, or something else. And that's when you try to perhaps to get Lakta Brahimi back in the game, get him suited up again, and put him on his put him on his UN jet. Maybe you even get Jean Marie back, back, uh, back, back in the game. Uh, but you take it seriously, and you start to take it seriously now. I don't know if I like the last point. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was just calculating that I'm the 14th speaker. Uh, so it's uh, it's a doubly challenging task because when I to say something new after I mean uh, as the number 14 uh, is probably impossible and uh, also you may begin to have an, an overdose of Afghanistan uh, so I'll just try to make a, a few uh, simple points uh, one that strikes me is how fecal we are uh, that is, I have looked at Afghanistan ever since two, 2001 and uh, on the, the shifting, evolving goals uh, about Afghanistan. Uh, it was obviously, it was a reaction to the tragedy of 9-11, uh, of but it was immediately packaged in a much broader and uh, grandiose scheme of, uh, of social engineering that we were going to rebuild a new Afghanistan, the, the cover page of uh, Time magazine uh, that I was mentioning uh, this uh, morning uh, to, to get us started. 
And now we tend to move from one extreme to the other. Uh, it's, pro it's proven difficult to re-engineer Afghanistan. We haven't had the fortitude, the persistence, the coherence, uh, the humidity uh, that is needed for such an ambitious goal. And so now we go back to square one and say, well, just let's make sure that uh, some Al-Qaeda uh, training base uh, is not reestablished uh, in Afghanistan. And I think it's a kind of binary approach with which I take actually very strong exception, uh, to be honest. Uh, I think the, this way of uh, opposing, well, either we, if we can't have victory, then let's pack up and leave but uh, making sure that Al-Qaeda doesn't set foot, I don't think that's a good way uh, to <coughs> frame the discussion. That's my first point. Anyway, my first point is linked to the second, which is that the confusion in our war goal, so to speak, is linked to a broader issue, which is the shifting balance of power in the world. There was a lot of discussion today on does Afghanistan per se matter or not? And we we're quite confused about that. And I think we're confused because the world is indeed moving. It's a cliche to say that Asia is, is rising. Uh, two days ago, I was, uh, I was in Dubai. And when Dubai is a, is a very strange place, a very artificial in many ways, but there's one thing you feel very strongly in Dubai where you, you see Russians, you see uh, uh, Chinese, uh, you see a lot of people from the Middle East obviously. You see in Dubai how the, the sort of center of gravity of the world is, is moving. And Afghanistan is part of that story. It's part of that story in a very concrete manner as you see uh, Pakistan and Iran uh, vying <coughs> for Minna being uh, I mean the, the gateway to uh, Central Asia with competing harbors on the, uh, I mean, I don't know if one who has, can call it the Indian Ocean, <laughs> uh, but certainly I mean, uh, in the, in the uh, warm waters of, I mean, uh, of the south of the, um, uh, of, south, uh, of Central, uh, Central Asia. Uh, Afghanistan is very much a part of that because depending on how Afghanistan stabilizes or doesn't stabilize, I mean, uh, the uh, uh, pipelines will be built in one way or another and uh, different harbors will be the exit uh, to uh, that part of the world where I mean, considerable natural resources have been, uh, have been found. Uh, the uh, way uh, China uh, will use the Malacca Strait or will go through different uh, roads also is linked uh, to Afghanistan. And we are confused about that and that impacts on policies because we continue to think of Afghanistan as if one country, the United States, could shape the outcome. I think Claire uh, said very rightly that in the early uh, days of I mean, Bonn, there was a conscious effort to bring the whole region together. And it's clear that today, any, any way forward for Afghanistan uh, requires to integrate such issues as, of course, and that was extensively discussed today, the Pakistan-India uh, uh, rivalry, uh, but also the Pakistan-Iran uh, rival, rival, I mean, uh, rivalry, also the uh, Central Asia uh, dimension that we, we discussed, uh, all that, I mean, all these countries have their own bilateral issues and Afghanistan is part of that equation. And so a country like the United States, of course, no solution, no way forward will be found without the support uh, of the United States. But that's, but the support of the United States doesn't mean that the United States, as powerful as it is, can shape uh, the outcome. That outcome will be the product of a much more complex uh, picture, where all, where China, where Pakistan, where India, where Iran, where Turkey uh, will have a say 
uh, and not to mention uh, the uh, Central Asian uh, countries that were discussed uh, this afternoon. And that makes for a much more confusing picture. But that makes one point. That is, Afghanistan matters. And matters in a much deeper way than just as uh, a place where some uh, Al-Qaeda base might or might not be uh, reestablished. And in that sense, it means that the false discussion between do we care about Afghanistan because we have a generous heart and we, we don't want those people uh, to which we, in a way, we brought war. <laughs> uh, do, we, uh, do, we, do we care just out of the, the goodness of our art or do we care because there are strategic implications? It's a false dichotomy. Uh, in a way, uh, Afghanistan matters because we meddle with Afghanistan uh, and Afghanistan matters <coughs> because it's, part, it's at the hinge of Asia, the Middle East, uh, and uh, that region cannot be ignored. My s third point, uh, which in some ways is linked to the second, is that governance, for the reason I just stated, is as much a strategic as a humanitarian goal. And there I would want to go to follow up on the discussion between the, the local and the national uh, that animated um, in the panels uh, part of the afternoon. I mean, it was said, and I very much agree with that, that, I mean, the Taliban, uh, with all their I mean, complexities, and we all know that I mean, uh, uh, it's a very, it's, it's a loose and complicated uh, issue and that, I mean, uh, uh, as uh, Michael say, was saying, uh, I mean, the Akani network is I mean, uh, distinct from the Ketashura and Gulbuddin Ekmatya is out there in, uh, uh, in one uh, particular uh, part of I mean, the eastern uh, uh, Afghanistan. We all know the, the nuance of that. At the same time, there is such a thing as a national uh, political uh, project. And because there is that, uh, that means that any effort just to, 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 to build a nation by a series of, of local deals, I mean, there is something fundamentally missing uh, there. Uh, and more than that, I think of the uh, French experience in Algeria, which, where there was a lot of attempts uh, to sort of uh, uh, get uh, defectors uh, from uh, uh, the uh, uh, movement, uh, the FLN, the movement, I mean, the, uh, uh, the, the Algerian fighters uh, who were fighting uh, the uh, French uh, uh, rule. Um, uh, that, I mean, some of those efforts were quite successful. Uh, and it's a normal uh, part of a military strategy. Uh, to try to get people on the other side to defect. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, who wouldn't do it? But at the same time, uh, it is uh, not uh, a political uh, strategy. And when you have a national movement, at some point you have to ask yourself, I mean, uh, whether that can be uh, the whole uh, strategy, uh, whether it can really be, be successful. And coming back to my governance point, what that means uh, is that governance, having I mean, what uh, Claire was describing, uh, is not just about uh, robbing the uh, Taliban of their support by uh, building institutions uh, around which the people will rally. It's also creating a base around which a negotiation, I mean, uh, some measure of national consensus uh, can be built because the Taliban will never negotiate uh, and uh, come to any agreement with a government that they uh, despise. Uh, and so <coughs> building a measure of credibility for a government is part of a negotiating strategy, not just to weaken the adversary, but to build a platform with which you can negotiate with the adversary. Now, what does that mean in operational terms? Um, I think it's all about the time frame. Uh, this is something that was alluded to uh, throughout the day, 
But I would want to, uh, to go a little, uh, to, to, to push on that particular point. We tend to uh, think again in binary terms. Either we shoot them or we negotiate. And we're looking for the kind of Dayton moment uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, that is not going to come. Uh, that is, I think, from everything we heard uh, today, it's very unlikely uh, that a Dayton moment is coming. It's very unlikely because when you look at the preconditions of both sides, they're just totally incompatible. <laughs> uh, one side uh, says, well, you have, I mean, uh, you have uh, to uh, uh, support the Constitution. Uh, you have uh, to uh, uh, essentially uh, accept the framework as is. And the other side says, Karzai, we never, we, we, we're never going to, to deal with that person, foreign troops, uh, we know we're not going to, to enter in, in, into any political discussion uh, as long as there are foreign troops. So, I mean, the, there is no overlap between the, the position of the two sides at the moment. Uh, and that means that what is most likely is that we have to gear for I mean, a protracted, and that I very much I mean, agree with what uh, Jim was saying on that point, we have to gear for uh, a rather painful, uh, protracted, uh, multi-year period of both, and not an alternative, of both military engagement and political uh, engagement. Now, the political engagement at the moment isn't there. Uh, and that's a problem in my personal uh, in my personal view that's a big that's a big problem but what that means is that n fighting is going to continue and negotiating uh, m more accurately talking before negotiating and probably proximity talks and that's why at some point the UN will probably be involved you need you will need a third party because in a in a in a in a moment in a in a context of war, talking would be a, talking directly uh, would be a sign of weakness, uh, and so none of the fighting parties uh, will want uh, to talk directly, and that's a very strong uh, argument uh, for a third impartial party such as the UN, with all the complications of them I and the. The present mandate of UNAMA in support of one of the parties, as was uh, said, I think, by, by Michael uh, Semple. Uh, but uh, the UN, as an organ, I mean, as I mean, the Security Council, as I mean, probably will have to get involved because of that incompatibility of uh, preconditions <coughs> and because of the fact that direct negotiation would send the wrong signal in terms of commitment on, on, both, on both sides. Um, the question, again, of time frame is the sequence. Uh, uh, do you, I mean, will we inflict on ourselves what, in a way, we inflicted on the Soviet Union? Uh, that is not to have a real solid deal before the Soviet Union uh, left, uh, which didn't lead to great results, uh, frankly. Uh, for Afghanistan and for the international community? Or will we be an, enlightened enough to understand that that engagement needs uh, to lead to, 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 to a, a real political conclusion before uh, the uh, troops uh, uh, start uh, leaving? Uh, that will be of the essence. But for that to happen, and I'll stop there, that requires a much broader support than just a national decision of the United States. It requires, in a way, an understanding <coughs> with countries uh, like China, like Pakistan, like India, like the Europeans, uh, to come together on that strategy. At the moment, there is no such a thing. And I would say, therefore, that the, uh, the real priority is on the one hand, to continue the long slog <laughs> uh, in Afghanistan, but on the other, to start in earnest the political engagement, the political engagement at the global uh, level, because the very disjointed uh, uh, um, situation at the moment at the, at the global level uh, is not a foundation 
for any uh, solid uh, process, which will be, which will not be again a one, uh, a three-month process, but a several uh, years process. So I'll stop there. And uh, well, it's uh, it's almost uh, it's five past five. So we we have. I mean, uh, if you are brave enough, you can uh, ask questions, uh, and we can. Uh, Continue till 5.30, please. which can enter this in all sorts of unpredictable ways. And I'd like you all to speculate on how you see that working. We've just had a, a wild 2010 election. We could have uh, another wild 2012 election. And a question of who lost Iraq uh, you know, to the Iranians or who lost Afghanistan, whatever. I mean, these kind of things could enter in all sorts of crazy ways. And how would that affect all this? Because it could completely change the nature of what you're talking about. Jim, I know you will have to, to leave at 5.15. Do you want to comment on that? I have no comparative advantage in answering that question. <laughs> Claire, <laughs> why is it for a Frenchman to comment on uh, American? <laughs> As my daughter would say, no fair. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, frankly, I... I, I do think that the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the the present evolution of American politics does complicate uh, the, the picture because if we are talking about political engagement, it's it's easy to make a, a case on behalf of I mean, uh, uh, a sort of a purist view of I mean, uh, of Afghanistan that we're just selling out. Uh, to, to, to Afghanistan. And so in that sense, I think it's not going to be easy for any uh, U.S. Uh, leader to, to manage those two tracks, of so the military track and the, and the political track, because the political track can easily be understood as selling out, uh, which I don't think it is, uh, but uh, it can easily be portrayed uh, as such. Uh, but I'm not a great expert on American politics. I have no comparative advantage, as Jim would say. <laughs> My two co-panelists are not eager to comment on that. Well, I think you're very right to raise the issue. Um, uh, I think it was interesting that one of the first statements that the <coughs> Republican um, Republicans made on assumption of, of control of the House um, was, was a support to the... To, to General Petraeus an existing strategy, um, but certainly there's a wing of the, of the Republican Party that with the Tea Party syndrome and a potential move towards isolationism, particularly given the budget pressures um, that the country's inevitably going to, as the rest of the world is, is, is going to come onto. On the democratic issue, I'm surprised that we haven't seen more of the anti-war movement that very much focused on Iraq transfer to Afghanistan. I think that's because um, Afghanistan, I question whether it should be called, it, a war at all. It's certainly, in my view, not a nine-year war. There was a three-week war in 2001. It was then a six-year under-resourced reconstruction or peace-building effort. And the, the war that has restarted is, is two years. But anyway, in, in the media, it is a nine-year war. Um, but so both parties have the potential to, to divide. And I think the real challenge is, can some kind of bipartisan consensus emerge on the need for a political strategy going forward? Um, really seems to be the key issue. But I do think increasingly that the budgetary pressures are going to play a role, and therefore I think that provides both a challenge and an opportunity um, to look at how as much can be done or much smarter effects can be done with far less money. In my view, we could be spending 10% literally of the money and getting bigger effects on the civilian side, not only by looking at Afghan revenue collection, and its ability to meet its, not to, to pay us back, but to meet its own costs going forward. Um, but even the amount that's being spent externally to invest much more smartly in building Afghan capacity rather than basically giving um, subsidies to contractors, NGOs, and, and UN agencies. Yes. 
Yes, I'm Dr. Polner, and I seem to hear basically in one form or another, we have to sort of get along and develop a consensus and so on and so forth. And so what, my question is, what do you think the WikiLeaks is going to do in respect to developing a consensus and the feelings about uh, dealing with the United States in general? Thank you. Wants to. I have no comparative advantage in that <laughs> question either. Other than I think it's a disaster. But exactly. you know, that doesn't add any information. So how but, I do, I, but I actually I agree with Zhao this morning. I mean, more damage was done. More damage was done by, by this book. <laughs> you know, this damn Woodward book <clears throat> than by WikiLeaks. I mean, everybody knew that the Pakistanis were perfidious. There's no, no big lesson <laughs> in, that, in that stuff. Mm -hmm. But, but the leaking of really the essential, the core discussions of the national security strategy for Afghanistan by the people who collaborated with the, with the, the Woodward book just, just appalls me. So if, if uh, Jean-Marie is right and we have a few more years to walk to, 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 uh, as we wade to this messy process, we probably have at least, if it takes six years, we have three more Woodward books we're all going to have to suffer through. <laughs> Uh, well, yes, and then, yeah. um, so, thanks. This was very helpful. I really appreciate everyone's presentations. Um, I wanted to ask something that uh, about what Claire Lockhart said, which uh, I mean, I think you said that the government is going to become self-supporting relatively soon. Well, there's the potential to do that, no? The latter, not. It, I don't think it's going to on the current trajectory because the policy <laughs> frameworks are not in place. It had, has the potential to if the right decisions are made. If, if, that's, if, if that is true, then that substantially revises um, our current perception of the uh, opportunities of the Afghan state and the U.S. participation, right? If the, if, the, if the Afghan state stops being what it currently is, what most people seem to think it is, which is a joint criminal enterprise, um, I mean, that seems to be the morning's consensus, uh, and becomes an actual state that can support a security force, then um, I, th I think that that's uh, a, a major change. And, and I would be curious to, to hear a little bit more about how we, we could make that happen. Um, it, it, it also make, makes me think of, if you, if you listen to um, some Army people, uh, Marines, other US military, the way that they think about capacity building in some cases is to help local officials spend US money. Um, exactly. And so. Uh, you know, if, if thinking about the, the Afghan state as an actual state which collects revenues is one way out of that, how could we uh, distribute that sort of thinking more widely? Claire. I'm ha happy to talk sort of f further afterwards in the interest of, of time, but um, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely critical. And, and, and Dr. Ghani and I both say if there's one measure of state effective sort of sovereignty, it's revenue because so much else, it's the relationship between citizens and state, it's the ability to pay for your costs. So it's absolutely <laughs> fundamental. And certainly, my, one of my big surprises in reading the Woodward book is the fact, and, and since confirmed, um, that revenue collection didn't come up once in 10 presidential discussions of the country. Um, so the whole economic agenda, and in discussions with SRSGs who've dealt with peace agreements around the world, when I asked them what their biggest regret in any of these cases was, it was, to failure to do with the fiscal and the economic situation. We have dealt with this before. Yeah, but their, their regret was that they didn't deal with it enough. Because what happens if you ignore the economy, young men don't have jobs and young women, but it's the men who pick up the guns. Um, you don't generate the revenue to pay for the future costs. And it's not that no economy happens. You get a criminal economy, it infects the politics, tips you back into some form of, of civil war or conflict. So incredibly important issue, um, and exactly how do we shift it around from in two ways. One is instead of seeing the external role in helping the Afghans spend US money, how do we flip that around and actually maybe bringing knowledge and expertise from the outside in very targeted, limited ways to help the Afghans raise and spend their own money. So shift the focus and the aperture on the domestic revenue flow, management of assets and expenditure is a critical shift in mental model and goal that needs to take place. And you know, the very fact that the UN and the World Bank call, I mean, 
huge, if we didn't have the UN, we'd have to reinvent it. What they do on the political side and peace agreements is fundamental and is indispensable. But on the economic side, the, the track record isn't good. The very fact that it's called a needs assessment when the World Bank and UN approach a country, instead of looking at the assets that are there and how to mobilize and, and let them come to fruition, I think we need to change that dimension. And one very concrete recommendation is to, 2001 to five wasn't perfect, but the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and the IMF pretty much had oversight of the economic agenda. In 2006, almost by accident, they were knocked out of the way. A UN role was crafted around the personality of Paddy Ashdown, who wanted the keys to the economic side. He then didn't turn up for various reasons. So the UN was saddled with the responsibility for the economic side without the personality to manage it. The consequence of knocking out the IFIs means that the economics slipped off the agenda. I don't think Kabul Bank fiasco would have happened if the IMF and the World Bank were doing their job. If you have the IMF and the World Bank and ADB, they're not perfect institutions, but it means the US doesn't need to play bad cop on, on the accountability issue so much. So bringing the economic agenda and the right actors to play is, is a crucial part of the way forward. Well, um, building on your remark about uh, the fact that we're going to fight and negotiate at the same time, probably in the coming years. Uh, I wonder if uh, the, the, these two elements are really integrated uh, in the current strategy. My point is that uh, I don't feel that the current fight is reinforcing in Kandahar, for example, is reinforcing the Afghan state or is helping the Taliban to, to, to go to the negotiation. On the contrary, my feeling is that the way the counterinsurgency is working right now is radicalizing the Taliban and weakening Karzai, actually. <coughs> and so my, my question is, don't you think that we have to rethink the way we are doing counterinsurgency or whatever, I mean, the military operation, to, to prepare the negotiation? For example, if you shift uh, the, major, uh, the major operation towards the defense of Kabul, for example, because if Kabul is stable, then Karzai is in a better situation to negotiate with the Taliban. So I think there is a deep contradiction here. And, and the, I, I would like to, to have your opinion about that. I, I would simply agree with you emphatically. I mean, this is, I would think, that was my last point, which maybe I made incoherently, which is that all the lines of operation, including how you fight, should be geared to how you expect to bring about a political solution that achieves your desired objectives. So how you use special forces, who you target, how many you target, where you deploy your forces, how you, use, how you build up the ANSF, where you deploy them. Everything should be geared in some logical sense to, to your strategy for a political solution. Well, I, I also agree with, with Jim, actually. I, I think that... Uh, uh, there is a fundamental difference between thinking that you can just uh, uh, cut the, I mean, as was uh, said by, uh, by one of you, I and mean, I think by you actually, uh, that you can just cut the uh, Taliban in smaller pieces and then swallow them, uh, or whether you, yes, you do keep military uh, pressure, but you don't have as a goal the notion that you're going to fragment more and more the chain of command, because at some point you do need to have interlocutors, uh, and uh, you, need, you need to have interlocutors in a national uh, framework. And I think there, there are, for the moment, there is no agreement on that. Uh, and I think it will, it will probably come from an evolution of military operation and the recognition that a, a genuine political process is, uh, is needed, but we are not there yet. If there are no, oh yes, please. Um, I, I was in here for the morning panel, so maybe some of this may have been discussed, may not have. Like, my, my understanding from the panels that I have attended is that everything is in flux. Like, you know, whether we had panelists who looked at the past, and you know, hindsight is 2020, and you know, and we have people now looking, you know, pondering what's what's in the future. And from what I get, everything is in flux. So, like, will America, you know, pull out of Afghanistan? Will it? Will it? You know, retreat? Will it abandon? 
And if so, will it, will it change like how it conducts wars? Because they, the thing I want to think, I, the thing I want to wonder about is that was, were we justified in going in the way we did in the first place? Will America change how it goes about? I mean, if we don't, we're basically going to go back into another of Afghanistan or what have you. So I'm just saying, or is there something like the UN could do? I mean, or you know that could we have some international law that would prevent something like this happening? Because I mean, we're just going to be repeating cycle. Right? So I'm just curious: have we learned anything? Because I think we. Well, what I would say is, I think the lack of uh, clarity on strategic uh, intentions of the United States with respect to, Afga to Afghanistan and the whole region uh, is not good. Uh, that it's very important to have uh, a sense, I mean, in a way that was said uh, by uh, Khalil, Ambassador Khalilzad uh, this morning in a different way, it's very important to have a sense of a direction uh, among the key, the key players. Because if you don't have that, every player is going to hedge uh, and to, to prepare for various uh, scenarios. And that in itself is deeply uh, destabilizing. So that clarity is necessary if you want to uh, gradually create the foundations of a serious uh, political uh, process. Do you want to say something? Or? I absolutely agree. And I, I think we've seen something of a shift to from a July 11 date being the drop dead date to now as a result of the Lisbon summit for 2014 being more of a re realistic point in time to think about transition. I don't see transition, and as I think people aren't talking about exit, they're talking about transition. I see that as a good thing in the sense that it clarifies that the US presence is not, an occupa it's not intended to be an occupation. It's intended to now, people see the um, critical path that has led to where everybody is now. Nobody would choose to be where they are now, but it's now about transition to Afghan sovereignty. Um, and I think we also see movements to looking at a strategic partnership with Afghanistan and looking out to the five and ten year frameworks. But I think on the whole, governments anywhere are not good at planning. This is a sort of move away from grand strategy um, for all sorts of reasons. And governments themselves around the world are the prisoner of the sort of four or five year cycle of democratic politics. And, and thinking about 10 and 20 year time perspectives is very difficult for anybody to do, but it's, it's necessary. I think on this uh, answer, we will close the conference and thank all the panelists for what has been, I think, a very good <laughs>